Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, before I start, <coughs> I would like uh, to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's uh, uh, really uh, important and uh, great opportunity for me, and uh, I very appreciate this. And now I would like, yeah. Okay, so uh, the title of my talk is Conservation-Oriented Restoration as a Primary Solution to New Challenges of the Anthropocene. And I'm not going to talk about the challenges. We've heard a lot about challenges yesterday and also this morning. I will be talking about uh, a, a solution, a solution as I envision it. And uh, if I would ask uh, many in situ people uh, a question, what they consider as a probable solution, many would say, oh, okay. Uh, many would say that, uh, of course, these are uh, protected areas, uh, uh, nature reserves and uh, national parks. But unfortunately, it was recognized years ago that land protection cannot guarantee the long-term species survival. Okay, got it. And uh, uh, just mere designation of protected area which was a primary approach for very long, is important, but not enough to protect biodiversity. And uh, uh, why I think that the re uh, reliance on passive conservation through strict area protection is not a viable strategy. A reason, as I highlighted here, is because it prohibits any modification of the protected habitat. And this is really necessary for several reasons. One is ongoing climate change, and another one is wide-scale anthropogenic disturbance. Climate change. We all know that for many species, the anticipated range shifts can be disastrous. And even if the populations are currently protected, many will disappear unless we do something to adjust their ranges. And anthropogenic disturbance is another very uh, 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 important things that we should address because virtually all ecosystems, including those in protected areas, underwent human impact in the past. And uh, this impact either disrupted previously existing species interactions and ecological processes, or reduced population sizes of many species below the viability threshold, or made regeneration impossible. Well, all these three altogether. And solving these problems in majority of situations is just impossible unless we do some management interventions. And these interventions must either maintain some important ecosystem dynamic processes, such as succession, or remove the dispersal and establishment limitations responsible for population inviability, even if they are in the strictly protected areas. And passive protection cannot help us with this. Okay, so you can say, okay, we have some other practices. Let's have a look at what other practices are available. This assessment of biodiversity is summarized in IUCN species categorization and creating numerous list of uh, red list of threatened species. These are global and regional prioritization of species, habitats, and areas for conservation. This is preservation ex situ, but usually with minimal coordination with in situ actions. This reinforcement or reintroduction of endangered species, but usually conducted at single or very few locations. And sometimes minor interventions in protected areas, usually limited to just control of invasive species and prescribed burning. These uh, practices are also not very helpful. And what we need, we need a new approach. A new approach that would reconcile all these practices with the new world realities and uh, challenges that we all are aware of. And such a creative approach should allow to deal not only with pristine areas, because there are no more pristine areas in the current world, but with altered habitats and guarantee long-term survival of species either by restoring recruitment in existing populations or creating new viable populations. And uh, uh, this means that there should be some integration of conservation biology and restoration ecology. And need, a need in such integration was recognized quite a long time ago, but the general idea of this integration has never been developed into a coherent uh, concept.
And if you, if you have a look at these two disciplines, of course, there are some differences in goals and practices. And uh, while for conservation biology, focus is on processes that occur in populations of threatened species, for restoration ecology, it's community and ecosystem processes. And the goal of conservation biology is to ensure species persistence, while for restoration ecology, it's to revitalize degraded ecosystem. However, if we want to conserve population threatened species, we identify a threat. And uh, in majority of situations, a threat is degradation of their environment. So to remove this threat, we need to deal with restoration of one existing uh, 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 conditions. And this is a subject of restoration ecology. By restoring a habitat, we do what restoration ecology do, and by this, we ensure species persistence. This means that conservation biology and restoration ecology actually are infinitely linked. And what I would like to add to this is that restoration of once existing conditions can be done not only for threatened species, but also using threatened species. It may sound paradoxical, but I will try to convince you. I call the concepts that I developed in the last three years a conservation-oriented restoration. And its major features include the following. That restoration is applied to a still functioning ecosystem, excluding cases when the destroyed ecosystem must be recreated. Habitat restoration is necessary for the majority of threatened species. Threatened plant species can be useful for restoration of natural habitats and be introduced not only into locations where they currently grow, grew in the recent past, but also into suitable locations outside the current range. Uh, the first two points apparently are pretty obvious, and uh, I don't need to talk much about these two, but the latter, the latter two are something, uh, sound some, in some ways that I need to convince you that they are true. And uh, I will try to do so, and then we'll proceed to general methodological considerations. So why I think that threatened plant species can be useful for restoration of natural habitats? There are several reasons. Many of them belong to important functional types. For example, large seeded animal dispersed, dispersed, uh, dispersed species. In uh, comparisons of non-threatened with uh, threatened species, we can see that fruit, si fruit set, seed set, and germination rates are quite similar. And distribution of individuals among size classes is also not dramatically different. Threatened species often have viable population demographic structure and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, frequency distribution approaches an inverse J-shaped curve, which is an indication of viable demography. In some threatened species, regeneration problems are apparent and uh, can be uh, a result of direct anthropogenic effect. For example, seed to seedling collecting, grazing, or logging. Once we remove this threat, we can see that the species will flourish. And uh, this is an example, this is a study uh, done by Kelly when he compared common and rare species, and you can see the demographic structures are really similar. Another paper, uh, this work done in uh, uh, Vietnam, six threatened tree species all have viable population uh, uh, structure. Another example from Vietnam, two more species. Uh, this is a species from uh, China, and this one is from Laos. Why I think that uh, certain species can be introduced not only into locations where they grow or grew in the past, but also outside their range. Because many represent formerly common, but now they threatened new rays. New rays uh, just the result of anthropogenic disturbance. For many such species, number of stand populations is critically low, and some have regeneration problems. Past ranges are usually poorly known, and there is uh, a problem uh, that you already know very well about climate change. And this scheme can show you what we can do uh, to broaden the, uh, the current niche of a species that you can see here. Oh, it doesn't. You cannot. Yeah, you can. For example, this is a niche of some species that we can broaden in two possible ways. One is through assisted establishment in the place where it lives, and another one through assisted colonization by introducing into the other locations. In some of them, the plants will uh, die, but in, uh, uh, at least in some, they may create new viable populations. So, uh, what limits usage of threatened species in restoration projects? Two things. 
One is lack of efficient methods of propagation and planting, and the second one is a requirement of large seed quantities. Uh, restoration ecology requires large seed quantities. And as I think, the first issue can be efficiently uh, uh, handled by botanical gardens, and therefore the second one, there is a solution called quasi-in-situ living collections. A number of uh, studies uh, uh, addressing uh, propagation protocols for threatened species is instantly growing, and uh, most of this work is done in botanical gardens. So much is done in this direction, but I think botanical gardens still have huge underutilized potential. And uh, about the requirement of large seed quantities, um, there is such a concept called quasi-in-situ uh, uh, living collections, which I developed in 2010. And an idea is that for a particular ecoregion, for a particular ecoregion, plant material, plant, plant material is collected in several populations and then is planted in some particular location which is protected does it work? So, but I hope you can, you can manage it. Uh, in some uh, location, which must be protected on one hand, and uh, on the other hand, it should have natural or semi-natural conditions. And the plants, after planting, are allowed to cross-pollinate and to produce seeds. The produced seeds can be used for restoration projects in this particular ecoregion. And these two photographs show uh, ex situ uh, uh, living collections in Israel and uh, created for threatened iris species. And you can note here, you can note a large number of fruits on these plants. I think you can see it. Okay, next question. How to determine suitable for threatened species locations? This can be done by a combination of species distribution modeling and experimental introduction. And this scheme shows all the steps. So uh, at the first step, you identify the existing locations, and then, then you use species distribution modeling to uh, find the locations which are suitable. And then experimental introduction will, will uh, uh, help to identify those locations which, where plants will grow and reproduce. And in these locations, you can do a real introduction. And uh, uh, actually, there are some examples uh, that um, restoration projects that started to use threatened species. I will show you just a number of these examples. This is a project uh, in Indonesia. This is another one in Indonesia. Uh, Vietnam, another project in Vietnam. Uh, this one in Mexico. Uh, yeah. I think Indonesia again, uh, Singapore, Brazil, Philippines. These projects show suitability and similar prospects for establishment of threatened plant species in comparison with non-threatened species in restoration projects. So now I would like to move to general methodological considerations. I will try to do it fast to stay within the limits that I have. First of all, where we can practice a conservation-oriented restoration. Hobbes distinguished three kinds of ecosystems. A historical, which remains within the historical range of variability. A hybrid, when, in which anthropogenic disturbance can be re reserved, reversed, sorry, and novel, in which it cannot. And uh, uh, so I, I think that Conservation-oriented restoration can be practiced only in hybrid ecosystems, but definitely not uh, uh, all hybrid ecosystems will have the same value, and there must be a prioritization. It should be based on two things, on degradation level and presence of threatened species. I propose the following prioritization. The top, at the top should be those in which highly endangered plant species still have populations, and these populations exhibit natural regeneration, the next from the top is in which highly endangered species to have populations but natural regeneration is not, ob not observed or depressed. And the next one is which uh, uh, those which are least degraded and which can potentially support establishment of endangered species. 
There are also varying degree of disturbance that are located within protected areas or are important for their connectivity and of varying degree of disturbance which have a low probability of supporting establishment of endangered species but have a good chance of approaching after restoration historical habitats. An important point for uh, species oriented restoration is reference. A range of uh, uh, variability in ecosystem composition, structure, and function. Reference is something uh, that's of vital importance for uh, restoration projects because it's used for comparison with contemporary ecosystem to relate the changes for design of the actions and for measuring success. The following points are important. That single reference ecosystem generally is, in, is inadequate. And uh, multiple alternative stable stage, stages must be targeted in a project. And search for these alternative stages should be based on assembly rule theory of theoretical community ecology, which states that community assembly is deterministic only in composition of trait-based functional groups but stochastic in terms of species composition, which means its exact species identities are less important than uh, functional groups. And the restored ecosystem should be realigned with current and expected future conditions rather than with pre-disturbance past conditions. Make a species list. How to make the, uh, the species list? Usually ecosystem functioning can be achieved with a limited number of species, but in conservation-oriented restoration, uh, uh, the number of species should be maximized and include species of high conservation value. And this is possible. Uh, I know this from the Atlantic Forest Project, which shows that this is possible and more than 50 native tree species uh, can be propagated and planted in large numbers very successfully. Another question related to this question of making species list. Uh, there should be a certain procedure. The candidate species from the regional species pool must be evaluated for their actual changes to establish. Endangered and rare species should be top listed. Species must represent functional groups lost during ecosystem degradation and which is necessary for restoring its functioning. And diverse flower and fruit types which support diverse pollination for givers fauna are especially important. And uh, uh, making species lists should adopt, the, uh, in my view, should adopt the dark diversity concept uh, uh, developed by Parton. Dark diversity is a set of species in a region that currently do not inhibit a site due to dispersal or establishment limitations. And what you can see here on this uh, uh, scheme is the green area which shows a restoration site. And this site has a limited number of species. Uh, this, these species are called char uh, characteristic diversity. But there are many more species in a region which represent dark diversity. When we plant these, these species inside, we convert dark diversity into characteristic diversity. And there are several examples of how this should be done. Two very good examples. One is plant reintroduction in uh, Midwestern oak savanna by uh, Brudwick and Marby. Uh, what they showed, they showed how to sieve the uh, species pool, which uh, uh, was quite large. It, uh, there were 900 species, and they sieved through a series of steps to a manageable species list of only 110 species. Another uh, example shows how to use species distribution modeling uh, to uh, create the assemblages of species for such small uh, scale as just 100 meters. And they're very successful, as you can see on this picture. Another important point is planting design. Uh, the working out the appropriate design should take into account several uh, things known to every ecology. That density of conspecifics can have both negative positive e effects. Density dependent effects of host specific natural enemies should be taken into account. This should be an only effect. And in general, relatively small but aggregated populations should be preferred to large but with sparsely distribution individuals because this makes it easier for plants to cross-pollinate and produce seeds. Biotic interactions is an important component that must be addressed in any uh, restoration project because, for, uh, as we know from uh, large experience, uh, restoration focusing only on focal plant species usually have a high chance of failure. And uh, such projects must consider reestablishment of the integrity of disrupted interactions crucial for ecosystem functioning. 
And uh, two uh, biotic interactions, two types of biotic interactions are particularly important. One is reestablishment establishment pollination service, and the second one, reestablishment of forgivery. In general, a priority should be given to large body, large gate, with one ranging forgiveness taxa, having the largest impact on ecosystem functioning. Uh, monitoring and assessment of success is very important. Must consider all the main steps from establishment of all plants to the regeneration and uh, evaluation success in restoration in terms of number of seedlings planted, their survival, growth, short-term changes in community structure is inappropriate. The only criterion for success must be successful regeneration. And this scheme shows all the steps that I just showed, starting from site prioritization through species um, uh, modeling of species distribution, and then actual uh, reintroduction or uh, uh, restoration, including all the steps which I just described. And uh, well, the concept was described in several papers uh, from uh, 2016 till uh, 2018, and uh, uh, eventually the book uh, it describes all these things in detail and is now available. It was just published by uh, Cambridge University Press, as Peter just uh, uh, said. And uh, thank you for your attention.